Middle school, she was definitely a tomboy. High school years turned her more into a girl. She seemed very happy. That's why we have a hard time understanding why she done this. This is me saying hi and sharing my story with you. Here's to the years we spent together and to the many more years to come until we end up little old ladies in our nursing home, playing bingo, drinking shots of tequila and know how much I wish I could be there. I love you. Amber's memory is encouraging classmates to speak up about bullying and to ask for help. It has been almost 48 hours since we started the Get Me to 21 campaign. We've had 1.2 million Twitter impressions. All of a sudden, you know, it's been put up on Facebook as, you know, Kaylee's bucket list. It went international. After a fatal crash at Terry Hills, David and Michelle Fry's 19-year-old daughter, Kaylee, was killed in a car accident. Now people around the world are sharing her dreams and ticking off her life goals. I just love the opening, the opening paragraph where it said, it is by any measure one of the most uplifting stories of 2014. And when I read that I went, uplifting? I lost my daughter. Hang on a minute. Uplifting. So we read on. Uplifting might seem like an odd or inappropriate word given that it has at its centre a shocking tragedy which left a young woman dead and her family and friends shattered. Kaylee to me was just that textbook genuine mate. I, I lived with her at uni for two years um, and we, in that time we got, we got a really good chance to bond. I was with Kaylee um, on that night and we started out probably about, there was probably about 10 of us that all gathered just to have a few casual drinks. Like I wasn't intending on having a big night, but you can't really help it when Kaylee buys you drinks, so biggest party girl I know. They were at Shark Bar, which is in the Manly Corso, and she lived 500 metres from there. Joe and I decide, decided to leave and Kaylee and Michael uh, stayed on for another hour. I can say that um, all four of us were in no condition to drive. What I believe, purely surmising of what I believe um, and what I've read on her phone for the week leading up to when she died, they'd sat out the front of her unit and then he said, no, I'm going home. And she said, I'll come with you and make sure you're all right which is why she jumped in the passenger side. I'm going out to cook now and chat. At first, when when I say when the police came, I, I I honestly thought they were when they said you know there's been an accident and Kaylee was involved and, and it was like okay we're going to have to go up to the hospital to visit her and what's happened when they said she you know, she died at the scene I was like no not, not my Kaylee no and the first thing Michelle needed to do was go and clear out her stuff from from her unit in Manly and, and bring everything home when she first went up there to uni you know, 17 sort of really young anyway Michelle had bought her this uh, journal to start recording little snippets of, of things while she was in this new phase of life in uni. When she graduated year 12, I bought her this and I said, when you start uni, I said, you can write all of your beautiful memories of your first year of uni in this and love, laughter, life. And just going through it, there, there was little snippets of poetry, her own thoughts. So I'm reading and I'm trying to share, I'm trying to be close to her. And, and about two thirds of the way through, my bucket list. Open my own business, learn to surf, write a song. I'm reading this stuff and I'm thinking, oh my God, oh my God. How come I got to this age and never had a bucket list? After a while, after a couple of hours, maybe after days, he said, I want to put this in her funeral notice. I want to share this with the people that attend her funeral. Gave it out to everyone and said, look, you know, as you go off from the funeral, you know, if you 
ever get a chance to do one or two of these things through the course of your life, you know, tick them off and take Kaylee with you and say you've done it for Kaylee. And that's 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 how this started. And we thought it was going to go from from there and get a few things done over the course of a lifetime. All of a sudden, you know, it's been put up on Facebook as you know Kaylee's bucket list. It went international. This is number seven off the list for an awesome girl. Happy birthday. Too many ways to walk in, too little time. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're reading through an adopted child, volunteer overseas, open an orphanage. So, oh my God, this is a 19 year old kid. What major aspirations these things are. Kale, look at me, look at me. The people that are on this Facebook page that have done all these things in her memory, most of them don't know her, have never known her, can never know her. It's a way that I keep her memory alive in my mind and give me reason to smile. The bucket list, um, all the attention is a bit overwhelming, but it's nice to know that people are there for us, that they'll look out for us. She was this big part of our family, and our family has been a little bit separated. It's, it's hard. I have to think about her, because I don't want her memory to die. And I think if I stop thinking about her, then she wasn't here. Mum's not too well. She hates Wednesdays, because that's the day that it happened. I try to look after her as much as I can, make sure she's all right. I just miss her so much. And I say every day, I just want you back. We've had a few issues, David and I, and I would go to Kaylee and I'd talk to her about it. And I'd be upset and she'd say, don't cry, don't cry, I'll be there soon and I'll fix it all, you know. I'll punch this person, I'll do this, I'll fix Dad, don't you worry, you leave him to me. <laughs> and, uh, but I was just most of the time letting off steam, but she was the person I turned to. Yeah, it says on the packet prawns, but we're putting mince in. Can't we put mince in? I can't try. <laughs> Isn't that what you put? Oh, that's, oh, fuck, that's your spring rolls. Yeah, Kaylee. Shit, ma! <laughs> I'm at Kaylee, first week of college. So three years ago. Kaylee was a crazy loud girl that everyone, everyone knew who she was. Even though she was 17 when she first started, everyone knew who she was. The first year of college, mother didn't give her anything. Her family didn't give her anything. So she literally had to pay her way through earning money for her accommodation. I think one of the first days she came to Manly, she walked down to Blue Water and said, I need a job. I don't even care if I have to be a kitchen hand. I just, I need a job now. She started off just as a regular waitress and ended up as a manager at one of the nicest restaurants in Manly, like supervisor there. Bateman's Bay was not big enough for her. She's such a big personality and big person. She needed to get out there and explore everything that life had to offer, so she was ready for it. She wanted to do it. As much as I would love to turn around and say, Kaylee is, you know, the epitome of kindness and sainthood, that's, that wasn't her. That wasn't her and people seem to have been like put on this absolute pedestal. People who don't know her and they're like, oh, she must have been, you know, like Mother Teresa. No, Kaylee liked to get heaps pissed and fall over and hurt herself. So she's not what people think she is. She was a real person. She'd be like people's daughters or their son's friends or, you know, their nieces or their cousins. She's, she was a cool person. 
She was out there living it while she had it. Go, Bella. You can do it. I do it by myself. I believe in you. I don't believe in myself. Sing, I believe I can fly as you jump. Three, two, one. Woo! <laughs> she was a big part of who I am and then now I'm not really sure who I am without her because I can't call her and talk to her about everything and like there's a lot of things that I can't do anymore because she was my go-to that's who I did them with or who I talked to about them and now I feel like I don't really know who I am anymore and I need to find myself. Yeah. Have you two finished eating? Yeah. Um, do you want to come up and spend some time in Kaylee's room? Because you had lots of memories in that room. You laughed a lot. <laughs> Bella, what I wanna what I wanna do is read your would you go over and grab her post? Yes. Your post. After the funeral at the wake, there was like a obviously lots of different coloured pieces of paper and everyone could write something if they wanted to and pin it to the notice board for Kaylee. So Bella's gonna read us mm -hmm. hers. Hey babe, I miss you. I know everyone has said that, but it's because you were the best part of a lot of people's lives. You've been my best friend for 10 years and I really wish you were here right now. I need you to know that through all we've been through together that I love you more than myself. Don't be sad it's over, smile, because it happened. Uh oh <laughs> Oh, baby, that's beautiful. Thank you. This just turned up in the mail the other day. She Facebooked me and asked me for my address. Are you in love with on Kayla's Facebook? Don't, that's, don't touch that I'm computer. I'm clicking on the photo of Kayla. Kayla's computer lives here. Nobody touches it, nobody moves it. That's its home. This is another beautiful gift I got. Hold that one. Did I see that somewhere on Facebook or something? Yeah, Some... you probably would. Some people so beautiful. This is, um, this is artwork. Complete an art, art piece for your house. And it turned up saying, the Fryer family care of Batemans Bay Post Office. Do I know who this lady is? Having a clue. Having a clue. Her trophies and other bits and pieces. Oh, here's another Christie Year 5 art piece. Everything. Christy. Christy. Mum, look what I made you. Look at it. Because she'd see all these other things turn up from people that she didn't even know. And so she felt like she had to do something for her sister. Tonight, we're going to a Katie Fryer Bucket List Gala fundraiser. A lady um, contacted me a number of months ago and asked me, had anyone done number 38 on the bucket list? And I said, no. She said, I'd really like to do that for you and your family. Beautiful. Number 38 is host a fundraiser and as you can see we're having a massive auction with the funds that we raised tonight will be going to Kaylee's Kitchen that's been built in Kenya. We've had over $25,000 worth of items donated which for, for our small community is massive. Can you hold my hand because I'm really nervous. Thank you all so, so, so much for coming here tonight and taking part in tonight's fundraiser. Um, the response has just been absolutely phenomenal. So from Michelle and I, honestly, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you. You never get to know the difference that she's making and the people that are going out of their way to complete her bucket list are helping people and that's more than she ever could have hoped from her own personal bucket list. If this hadn't all happened, it would have just been goodbye and, and the funeral and bury her and that would have been it. There would, would have just been this massive hollow in our lives. We know she's not coming back. I know we're not in denial or anything like that, but, but as long as we've got this thing going, we're keeping her legacy going and, and her spirit going. These were her dreams and her wishes, and we're just giving her a bit of a hand. I'm sad all the time, but when I look around this room and see people that have given up their time and to come and do something special for, for my daughter, that makes me feel happy. The family creating the Facebook page is 
it's fine. Like they asked at the funeral if we could, like during our lifetime, complete some things on the bucket list. And the fact that's, that so many people's um, contributed to that is fantastic, but you can't let that be the memory of her. Yeah. Michelle will never move on, ever. Especially not trying to hold on to this Facebook page. Sadly enough, she's never gonna get Kaylee back. Ever. That's how it is. I've gone from 37.5 milligrams of antidepressants to 150 milligrams. Um, does it work every day? Not really, because I still cry. I wake up sad too many days today. I wake up happy. And I sing I'm here. all the songs that they hate. <laughs> good morning, good morning, let's get ready for the day. Hooray! Who said that I hated that song? Oh, your sisters do. Perfect have... poached eggs. Have Look at that. Restaurant quality, perfect poached eggs. Good morning, my darling. Eat. And all the time, every time we eat poached eggs, who do we think of, baby? Eggs. My girl on poached eggs. <laughs> I was talking to Bella the other day and I said to Tom, we're going to have breakfast the other day. I said, we might have a Kaylee breakfast. She goes, poached eggs. Straight up. I don't ever want the talk of her or the memory of her to ever stop. Christy, you need to. Um... Get ready. Yeah, you need to I hope people talk about her and her bucket list and her life and how she made them want to change their life. I hope it never goes away because it's, it's all I have left. Amber was 16, going on 17. Kim and Alan Cornwell say she came home from a date Friday night and seemed perfectly happy. We thought this was a great year. She was 11th grade this year. She played tennis. Um, she, she was in dance. She was in chorus. But despite all the reasons to live, on Saturday morning... And we found our daughter had committed suicide. Amber's last posts on the night before she died leaves them in tears. She put something on Facebook that said, if I die tonight, will anyone cry? We love you. We love you, Amber. This was me and Alan <laughs> pregnant with Amber. I was at the beach when, with Amber in my belly. I actually found out I was pregnant with Amber um, before we got married. So she was my baby I was never supposed to have. I wasn't supposed to have children. So she was my miracle baby. She's a little chunky monk. Love bath time. That's with her, with her daddy, when daddy was young. She never could play by herself. You know, she always had to have somebody playing with her all the time. Even though she was, at, for, for five years, she was an only child until Brianna come along. 
Yeah, I was very close to Amber. She's my older sister, and there's really no one else. She was like my friend. We were blessed to have two wonderful children. Probably a lot of the memories from when she was little is when we was first uh, going hunting and fishing. And She went bear hunting, deer hunting, turkey hunting. She was daddy's boy. The only really picture I got of me and her hunting together. I had some on my other phone, but it broke. And then now all I got this dinosaur phone, so. That was my buddy hunting in the woods, that's for sure. Brianna, she don't mind the fishing part, but she, she's not into the hunting part. Amber, she's like me. Anything I went and done, she's usually right there with me. Middle school, she was definitely a tomboy. High school years turned her more into a girl. We actually met through Facebook, so it was a little bit weird. Like, we had never really met each other in person. Like, well, you know, it just for a couple weeks, it kind of went through, like, we would like each other's statuses and pictures and stuff, but, like, we never really talked. And then we were like, where do you live? And then where do you live? And it was, like, right next to each other. So we were like, we should hang out. <laughs> I, you know, I just fell in love with her, I guess. She would always talk about Andrew to me, and she, she loved him. She loved that boy. He works at Burger King. He's a cutie pie. Um, he was homeschooled his whole life. They were just, they loved each other, you could tell. And she had been told at school, oh, he's too good for you. He's too nice looking for you. You don't deserve anybody like that. Like, I knew that she was depressed, and I knew that she, like, was, didn't really like her school situation and didn't like all of, all of that stuff, but I didn't think about it as being something that was so immediate. She loved me, and she, you know, we would go to church every week together. And I was trying to bring her out of her, you know, how she was feeling and her depression and all that. Whenever she was with me, that's when she was happy. I decided to learn how to do this instead of doing construction. So Kim learned from a lady that learned from the New York Grooming School. That's who she learned from, and I learned from her. We got the two girls, and I didn't see them doing construction that I was doing, so I kind of broke off of that. To keep this going, so in case the girls wanted to get into the dog grooming business. It's already pre-established. I don't know. You try and plan, but sometimes it don't work out. Amber went to school on Friday the 19th. It was a half day. They were out for uh, Christmas break, so they only went to 12 o'clock. She got off out of school. I knew she was going off with Andrew, her boyfriend, and they were spending the day together, and I just told her to be home by 11 o'clock. Uh, it was a Friday night. We were hanging out with uh, my group of friends, and everything was good, and, and then she had to be home at 11.30. And everybody else, we were all about to go walk Main Street, you know, and hang out, and she really, really, really wanted to come. And I, you know, and I really, really wanted her to come, but I was like, your parents want you home. You gotta be home. If I don't get you home, then I won't be able to come see you tomorrow, you know? So I brought her home and she kinda, when she got out of the car, she kinda seemed, you know, she kinda seemed that she was upset about something, but no more than usual, you know? And I was like, I was like, look, just hold on. I'll be home in an hour or two and we can talk. She come in at 11 o'clock that night happy happy-go-lucky Amber, you know, tell me about her evening. I actually was putting presents under the Christmas tree for her. I went to bed around 11, 30, 12, and she was happy. She was sitting here on the computer happy, waiting on Andrew to call, text her back when he got home. I was just out until like one in the morning, and then I went home, and then she had texted me and had 
you know, said, but she said like, like, I can't do it anymore, you know, I really need to talk to you. And I didn't, this was before I had an actual phone. I just had Wi-Fi. And so I wasn't able to respond because I was out. And then when I got home, I saw them and then I tried to message her back and then I never just, I just never got a response. And so then I messaged her, you know, for a couple hours and never got a response. So I just assumed she had went to bed. I got up that morning and her door is usually, she usually keeps it mostly shut. And I actually pushed the door open enough to where I seen her closet door open and I seen her butt sticking out and I thought, what are you doing hiding from me? And then as I got further around, I could see where she hung herself. He started hollering. I jumped up out of bed and went and looked and she had hung herself in the closet. She had tied a belt around her neck. And um, the medical examiner said she must have died around 1 a.m. And that was right after I talked to her. I was going through my news feed and all I saw was Rip Amber and Poor, poor Amber, you know, fly high. And I just, I, I thought it was a joke. And so I asked one of my friends what was going on. And she said, Lexi, Amber hung herself in her closet. You cooling off yet? What a good boy. There we go. All right, put it down. I asked my mom if I could be on Instagram or Facebook, and she said, can't be on Facebook, but I can be on Instagram. I just like it because I have friends on there. Because I don't really have friends in like real life. I'm close to my mom, but not really my dad. Because he was more close like to Amber more than me. Me and Amber had a different bond. I feel like she loved me more than anybody else in this house. I feel like she loved me more than my wife or my other daughter loves me. So with that's gone, yeah, that was devastating. I don't know where down the line. I don't, I don't know. Still a lot of questions I don't know. So I don't know. I taught her to be strong, and I don't know where she went so weak. She seemed very happy. That's why we have a hard time understanding why she done this. Because I'd pick her up from school almost every day. I'd be like, you know, how's your day? And then she would just tell me that this so-and-so said this today. So-and-so called me a bitch today. I know people called her a whore or a slut, you know, because they were either jealous of her or they wanted to be her. There's nothing really that I could do about it other than tell her to ignore it and, you know, just freeze it off because it's, it's just bullshit. It's just high school. That's what high school is. Because that's how my high school was. That's how, you know what I mean? That's how a lot of people at high school is. Roll with the punches. It's, you know, it'll be over. It's not, it'll get better. As students get back to their routine, Amber's memory is encouraging classmates to speak up about bullying and to ask for help. I do blame one child in particular, and it's only because, um, she likes to brag about it still, that she killed Amber. Kara Elizabeth Browning. The only thing I know about it is she's just harassing her. Just wouldn't just, anything Amber commented or said or anything, she always had to come back something negative or stupid about it. She just wouldn't leave her alone. She had been talking about suicide and Kara told her, quit talking about it and do it. And the next morning I found her. Kara called me and said, called me absolutely hysterical, screaming and crying, saying that it's Amber, it's Amber. She told me that she killed her. They were talking about how Amber was gonna kill herself 
And then Kara said something along the lines of, grow up and come back into reality and get in the real world because you're not gonna do it. And then come to find out an hour later, she did. I need to say, I can't wait to run into her parents or whoever they are. So, yeah, I'm waiting on that day. I'm a believer in karma. It's gonna come around. I'm not going and looking for him, but I'll run into him one day. Zach called me today to warn, warn me about this interview, but you had already called. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you my side of the story. When I moved from East, I didn't talk to Amber anymore. I didn't really talk to any of my friends from East. I heard she was posting stuff on Facebook about cutting herself and wanting to commit suicide. I figured she was like any of these other kids nowadays, doing it for attention. So I, I the, the day she died, I, before I had known she died, I sent her a message telling her basically that she needed to get a grip, that she, if she was doing it for attention, she needed to stop. She was loved by so many people. She played tennis, she sung, she could get any guy she wanted to. I mean, look at her picture, she's stunning. I just, she had a boyfriend. I just don't see how somebody commit suicide just because Somebody else is saying things to them. I mean, you need to have thicker skin than that. I mean, I, I hate that she committed suicide, but uh, this is going to sound terrible. And I'd never say it to her mom, never. Good thing you're saying it on camera then. Amber's the one to blame for the suicide. She's the one that made the decision to do it. For a while, I. I I did feel like I had killed Amber, and then I heard that she had, I heard that she had committed suicide the night before, and then I realized I hadn't sent that message until the night after. So then I realized she never even saw my message. There is no actual physical evidence that we have in hand to say this person bullied or that person bullied. So her phone, I had nothing on it. The sheriff's department had it for a week and they found nothing on it. She's a smart girl when it comes to covering stuff up. She knew how to cover stuff up, unfortunately. I didn't want to see her Facebook page. I wanted nothing to do with that computer. And I didn't want them to be able to put anything negative on there, so I said shut it down. I didn't really like when they closed her Facebook page down because I wanted to go back and I wanted to look at all those memories, you know? Because I don't have her voice anymore. I don't have, I don't have anything of her anymore. My mom said at the funeral, that we just say bye, and so I said bye at the funeral. When I miss Amber, I usually just focus on something else besides her. We saw something that nobody can take away. But she was only 16. I don't want any more parents to have to go through this. It needs to stop. This is really just me pushing play on my webcam, on my computer. I'm in the lounge in my day bed and I just wanted to check it. No, no. <laughs> Please. Hey, I had a really rough day today, so I'm sorry if I haven't replied to any messages or posts. I can easily delete this, so I think I can use it as an honest thing. This could be an emotional check-in. The moment I start questioning what I'm afraid of and breaking things down into individual parts, like, am I afraid of being 
with the nurse. No. Am I afraid of going to sleep? No, then I'm okay. It's just the general impression. I, I get this terrified feeling. But it is scary being in hospital. It's not where you want to be for this long. And go for it, Jane. I have a very rare condition called pulmonary hypertension. And I was diagnosed about two years ago when I was 18. Originally, I was told that it was psychosomatic, which is a bit of a freak out because I was told that by numerous experts and, you know, being um, convinced that you're messed up enough to make yourself sick when you're feeling physical symptoms is very difficult um, and it definitely undermines what you're going through. blood can't circulate properly through my lungs and therefore I can't absorb the oxygen that I need. And it's degenerative. It's terminal. People really hate it when I talk like that. Everyone here probably wants me to describe my illness as life-threatening or as serious. But it's not just life-threatening, it's terminal. I've looked up the statistics and asked all the difficult questions and I am dying. It was originally a shock to discover what was wrong with me. But the second shock, which is one that I think patients in other parts of the world don't experience, was realizing that really nothing I needed was available to me. The resounding um, sort of feeling that we got from everyone was, look, don't even bother asking. Don't bother trying. This is impossible. Ideally, if we had it, I would put you on Byzantine and Flolan, but that's not here. You're never going to get it. So just go home and, you know, try not to think about it too much, which my parents didn't accept. <laughs> I'm incredibly lucky to have an incredibly stubborn family. We realized we had to skill up and we had to make it happen. Otherwise, we were never going to get what we needed for our gen. And really what we did was realize, hold on, we have to use every skill we've got as a family, not just me, Stuart with all his marketing skills, Jenna with her incredible uh, speaking skills, public skills. She's an a very academic and very successful young lady, and Christy with her beautiful voice. Let's take everything the family's got and let's find a way to fight this. Hi, everybody. Getting to the point of um, going public, as a matter of speaking, has been a long and a slow emotional process for all of us. Five weeks ago, when I pushed send on the first invitation for tonight, I have to admit to putting my head down on my keyboard and I wept. Reaching out for help is not an easy thing to do, but now that we have, I am simply blown away. Awareness is thus a key in early diagnosis, which can prolong your life expectancy if you start treatment earlier, and in um, having available treatments. So that's kind of what we wanted to do with the Trust, and um, as I'm sure most of you have seen, we started the website, and I started blogging, which was odd for me. Me and my sister produced a song, which I wrote, and which she sings. Okay, okay, let's go. The, let's make it this. Do we go so I save the moment or save in the moment? Because either could work. So, Just depending on how fast you sing it. You know so I, mean? I will put I there because this is kind of personal, I think. Standing alone in the crowd, puppets smile on, voice too loud. Stop. You've written the song, Jenna. Yes. You've written the words. You sat down one day and you wrote a song about your life right now. I really just thought that if I give up now and play victim, I mean, no one's going to blame me, but the only person that I'll be hurting is myself. And I don't want this illness to make me 
Um, I don't want to view myself as less of a person than I was before I was diagnosed and I don't want to disengage from the goals and ambitions that I've hold so, held so dear my whole life. We got a lot of traction on radio with interviews and with that song in general and amazing things started happening. Feeling your life speeding up, savor the moment, just know when to stop. Jenna and her family started the Jenna Lowe Trust to educate others and raise awareness about the condition. They aim to help other sufferers get an earlier diagnosis and access to the treatment they need. One woman has already been diagnosed as a direct result of our campaign and that for me makes it completely worth it. It's a cause that I've not wanted but that's been thrust upon me and which I think is going to become a massive part of the rest of my life, however long that may be. Recently there's this whole new trend. I call them the YOLO people. The people who um, want to make the most of the night like they're going to die young. <laughs> and they piss me off quite a lot. The worst is beautiful girls my age smoking. Every weekend I wonder if anyone ever stops and thinks about what it must feel like for me to see them fuck up their lungs when I have done nothing wrong and mine are killing me. This is building. I don't know. I don't know how this fucking thing works. We lived a lifetime in 20 years, her and I. And if she was scared or sad, or joyous or anything. She spoke to me. The unfortunate thing is that I think I was diagnosed too late. I have been deteriorating and my most recent checkup, I was told that I'm going to have to be listed for a bilateral lung transplant. Read off the red nose reindeer. Reindeer. You'll go down in history. Okay, well, I didn't answer those voice notes last night because James was here last night. <laughs> Holy shit. Camilla, yes, he's such a good kisser. He's like, I don't know, it's like on a whole nother level. Oh my God. Um, yeah, I'm kind of happy, and, um, we're kind of like a thing now, so it's all very cute. <laughs> she loved seeing the world from outside of her little bedroom, because well, she didn't leave there too often. And Jen got quite, I wouldn't say lonely, but being stuck in bed, you get bored, apart from getting lonely and a bit bored. She was a bit worried about people forgetting about her. She was worried that she would get invited to an event and wouldn't be able to go, so she wouldn't be able to talk to people as much. She was worried that she'd fall out of social circles. Um, not many people are going to forget about her, especially after the impact that she had in the social media um, awareness that was just everywhere. So no one was forgetting about her, but it's a little bit hard to see that side of the story when you're in your room the whole time. Hi, I'm Jenna. I'm 19, and I'm planning my 21st birthday party now. And I'm inviting you. Now, that might seem a little bit odd, because I probably don't know you, but I would like you to come anyway. And I don't care what shape, size, color, age you are, I want you to be there with me. All you really have to do to come to my party is to sign up to be an organ donor because in order to make it to 21 I'm gonna need new lungs. The problem in this country is that there are 0.3 percent of the population are registered as organ donors. So if you need an organ in this country you, you it's a death sentence. There's, there's very small chance of you actually receiving an organ. It has been almost 48 hours since we started 
the Get Me to 21 campaign, and in that time we've had 1.2 million Twitter impressions roundabout, and a couple thousand YouTube views, and the response has just been amazing, and everyone is sharing it, and it's incredible. Get Me to 21. Jenna, thank you for being brave. Uh, thank it's a beautiful you. thing. Go and check out the website, and we're coming to your birthday party. Yes, Most we definitely. are. Oh. Yeah. Thank you very much. And that's Jenna Lowe. Thank you for the video. Thank you for the awareness. Thank you for your selflessness. Hopefully this transplant will give me a second chance at everything. Because for the last couple of years, one thing I've struggled with the most is not being allowed to have dreams. Because I think everyone focuses on the future quite a lot to get you through things. And then you hear that you might get a transplant. It opens up all these possibilities again and you can dream. I have to ask, how urgent is your transplant? It's pretty urgent. Um, yeah, so ideally, in my mind, I would get my transplant really soon so that I could be at my 21st, which is in October next year. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, it is hopefully going to happen in the next couple months. While I wait for that, I'm pretty much at home, stuck in my room, because I'm not doing so well. I spend about 60% of my day sleeping and um, the rest of the time I read or just lie still because it's very difficult for me to move around or exert myself in any way. She had the operation yesterday afternoon. It went really, really well and she's currently in recovery. One little video which went viral literally saved her life. That is phenomenal. That is really, really phenomenal. And I think the lesson here is never give up. It's a major, major surgery. It was an eight hour surgery. Hello, Bean. Hi, guys. <laughs> Thanks for me taking a video. Say hello. Dear. We didn't realize how bad she was and how far gone she was. She didn't have long to live before her transplant. Months. I need you to join me suiting up. You look spectacular. Oh, yeah. Look at James, he cleans up nicely. Eh? Of Jen and I only managed to have two dates, and both of them, either her mom or her dad, were there. Hello. It's Jen and James. Put your mask back on, no breathing on me. <laughs> Seriously, don't even joke. And we are in hospital in... Seven days. Section seven. You said that, I didn't even know. And um, so I still have a little bit of Bell's palsy. This eyebrow is paralyzed. Can you see? You're so weird. And now I'm going to pause this and use the camera to take off my makeup, I think. Bye. Why don't you go the other side so that you can use the handrail? Okay. Then you've got sister on the one side and handrail on the other. Better plan. One, two, there's no rush. So obviously post transplants, almost 12 weeks now. I'll probably be out next Tuesday. <laughs> and five, you are a hero. Well done, Jen. Catch your breath. Doctors have never seen one patient be dealt so many challenges. She fought and fought and fought till the very end and kept coming back from, from the edge. I think looking at myself while I speak is a bit, it's quite important because I've just seen my face move slightly. At least I caught a glimpse of Jenna because this fat face and 
whatnot. It kind of makes it hard to recognize myself. She never left the hospital and um, she went through a lot. And we hadn't really spoken about those six months because Jane's legacy and what she wanted to do was save other lives. And I don't want her journey and her life to be in vain. As long as there's fire in my, fire in my heart.